Hello out there. This video is going to be the first of my series on just updates, just little weekly updates. I figured people like to see all these different things and as they progress, and it's much easier to do it that way than to just put one video out at the end of each project because sometimes I might not have something ready in, uh, in a reasonable amount of time and I don't want to put only a video maybe every two months or so. I figure it's more fun to have them more frequently. So I'm just going to give you a little breakdown, first of all, of how the shop is set up and then the different projects. There, there are tons of things, different things come in every week and um, I'll show you the progress as they advance and you'll get to see some things like this guy from start to finish and you'll get to see some things in the middle and then you'll get to see some things that are procured along the way. So I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to start with this little press. You can see the good old workbench is an absolute explosion, but whose isn't? This is a Kelsey Excelsior 3x5 inch benchtop printing press or a platen press. I found it in a yard in Havelock, Ontario, and it's generally in good shape. Everything's there except the, the type carrier and the I'll have to make new rollers, but that's common when you restore these, they need rollers are gone. But you can even see traces of the gold paint if I flip it up where it says Excelsior. So this would have been a black machine or a dark, dark gray with um, yellow or gold writing outline. Um, it, it, it's very dry, so I know it's been outside a while, but not long enough that the pine board that it's on is deteriorated badly so I, I don't think the seizing is going to be that thorough it'll need some oil and then cast iron so it'll get some heat that shouldn't be a problem there is the most major flaw with it is you can see the underside part of this arm system is quite badly broken so that'll be brazed it's cast so it shouldn't be that bad of a job to repair but you can see it's also been where is it? Right there. It's been brazed before, if you can see that kind of rounded point. So anyway, not too worried about that, but I'm going to strip that. I'm going to start. Well, hey, might as well do it right now. Good old crown. I prefer this stuff over WD-40. It's it's treated me better in the past and it hangs on longer. I find WD-40 likes to um, uh, vaporize into the atmosphere much more quickly. This acts as a bit more of a preservative that'll stick around longer crown rust protection these guys also do lots of undercoating apparently you can use this stuff as undercoating but it might be too thin for that so i'm just going to hit these points pivot points and these are peened these aren't aren't um bolted or set screwed so i'll, I'll try to refrain from disassembling stuff like that because i'd need to make new pins and uh, pin them back in. Those pivot points, that's the little retainer, this guy, um, the plate itself. The plate rotates, there's a ratchet and it pushes it just a slight turn, like maybe 1 20th of a rotation per time you move the handle. So. There we go. So we'll let that sit and linger, think about itself. Um, my machinist toolbox, that took quite a while to find. It's it's a bit of a homemade affair, but it's um, got the green line drawers. Oh, there's some tools in that part. It's going to be filled up over time. The only thing that it's a bit of a... Um, a bit of a divide in my mind because it's a beautiful toolbox and I'd love to fill it with antique tools, but this is my shop. It was actually a pigsty and the floor dipped one foot from that corner to that corner. So I filled it with gravel, which is awesome for running around. It's especially awesome for the forge. Stuff falls on the floor. It doesn't really matter. It's, um, as a blacksmith shop, it's, it's really comfortable, but as soon as you get precision machine tools, and precision hand tools in there's humidity that you don't really want to have playing around with that type of stuff so i'm divided on whether or not i'll fill her up or maybe just the second set of tools here's another project dividing head this is a brown and sharp 
what's known on the market as the BS series. You can get BS0 and BS1 dividing heads. They're still made. Um, this whole body rotates in the base. So you can do pretty well any angle with this whole unit rotating. And then there's a pin, uh, pinned plate here for doing quick indexing. I think there's maybe 32 holes on this. And then there's a chuck. This is a later chuck, a Pratt, but it's it's really good. The, the um, twists per movement in here are, are very slow, so it's quite precise. Um, this, I'm missing the sector, as most of you would recognize, that you spin around. Um, it was just gone, so anyway, get a replacement, no big deal. There's a second plate there, down there, but the Brown and Sharp series of dividing heads should come with three plates. Um, the nice thing with Brown and Sharp 2, their pattern is very common, so they're still made, and you can go back into the archives on vintage machinery and whatnot and find the information you need to know. It's a 40 to 1 dividing head, so 40 rotations of this arm makes the chuck rotate once. It's sitting on a Rockford milling machine. Really nice milling machine at the time that they were made. They were quite high-end, but this one's missing quite a bit of the gizmos. There should be an overarm that would come and support. See the spindle in there? There's a drawbar. It's a really strange collet. I think it was the same as an early South Bend or something. It might be 5C. Anyway, I haven't found a, found another set of collets for it yet. But The nice thing is it came with a matching cone. So uh, up in there, the cone will be mounted and just a shifter, just a forward, probably just a forward engage. I don't think I'll bother with a counter shaft because it's so hard to find forward reverse counter shafts for these machines. You can see there's a, this gives you up and down, this gives you in and out, and this is a, uh, there would have been a power feed on this, but the mechanism is missing, which is a shame. You can see with my finger, I'm pushing in the engaging lever for that, and you have a stop that you'd set here, and this pin would end up pushing it and disengaging the power feed. It, from what I can tell, it, it's basically set up for doing small gear milling and that type of stuff. You could have bought them. There, there's a shaft that would go through here, run by uh, pinions in the back, and that would allow you to run a slotting head or a vertical head, which is pretty darn neat to have, but it would have come on a pedestal originally too, but that's all gonzo. Over here is the drill. It's a Barnes 20-inch, same one that you'll recognize from David Richards' steam-powered machine shop. The only difference is this has the earlier flat belt three-step um, power feed. His has a, a gear-driven type, and I think it has more options. It's a great drill. Uh, the downside is the main bevel gear has already been replaced once out of brass or bronze. And the power, uh, I got this from a friend of mine. He drilled something, some crazy drawbar really slowly. But with the amount of power that's been transmitted through that guy in a bajillion years, probably be... Maybe it'll be visible just under the guard there. The force has actually pushed some of the teeth out of alignment and naturally there's some wear on it. So I'm not sure how long it's going to last. It also needs the back gear is engaged by a lever here and it's broken off, but that's no big deal to make. There's a, um, like a Model T transmission inside the head there, a planetary reduction. It makes this drill really, really neat, somewhat compact. I have a pedal down there that was just forged because it's hard to find. Almost all of them don't have the pedal and the change gears, but luckily this one's sorted out. You see a really cute little Peter Wright leg vise back in there. It's only got three inch jaws or so. It's a resto project and some pulley centers. Um, you also notice the governor, that's a waters governor. And then on the floor is a gardener. Uh, both of them are missing the vowels, which are a shame, but th that's for a coming video on comparing steam flyball governors. Pedestal grinder, partly taken apart. One of the coarse side is off. That's a, a Petri, made in Toronto. Um, the neat thing is, I don't know if you can see it there, Petri was only known really as a distributor, but this is actually cast into the grinder itself so it either means that they contracted out or that maybe they did have some foundry capacities over here morse taper drill bit holder in the back and this is the myers lathe there's a full video on me restoring this this was last year almost all of last winter's project and it's an absolute beauty it runs like a top and up on the ceiling above it is the forward reverse counter shaft which is quite a marvel of its own quite uncommon these days 
but it works like a top. It comes over to the lever here. There's my hand here. And you can see that ball shifts back and forth. The belts are disconnected to keep the tension off of them because it's a somewhat humid period of the year here in the shop. Next is the Crescent 20 inch throat bandsaw. And then in behind it, you can see the little Fairbanks Morse engine that runs the whole shop in the case that I don't have the motor. The motor, the little repulsion induction motor that runs the line shaft is only a quarter horse. So it's not much, not much good aside from making everything turn and look nice visually. When you put a load on any machine, it starts to disagree quickly. Over there on the wall is my first restoration. That's a uh, Jardine um, post drill. It's a two speed, which is quite neat. I'll show, show that how that works in a future video. Um, works like an absolute top. I use it to drill almost all the time. It, it's maybe if you had a bench top electric drill, it'd be faster, but I find it faster to just hop over here from making hooks or whatever on the anvil, just hop right over there and fire it right up and it'll drill through eighth inch, quarter inch steel and not that much time. And you can set the feed rate, feed it by hand. Very nice machine. You can see beside it is the pulley wall as well. And then out the wall behind that rear shaft, um, rear pulley, sorry, the shaft protrudes maybe six inches out, outside. So I'd love to build a lean-to outside this building someday and put other goods in there. Hope you enjoyed that. There will be more of these down the line, more of these little videos. And uh, as each machine gets hooked onto the line or as significant progress happens, I'll throw another one out there. If you have any questions or if you want me to zoom in, focus on any aspects of this place, put them in the comments, I'd be more than happy to. Um, if you are on Instagram, go check out the Cast Iron Machines channel page, whatever you want to call it on Instagram. And uh, alternatively, if you're watching this through Instagram, go on YouTube, check it out, subscribe, and um, see you next time.